Excellent. Okay, so welcome to the first ICCS Journal Club of the New Year. Uh, today we've got one of the new uh, one of the new Vesby projects, uh, Fetch Four, um, talking to us, giving us an introduction, um, sort of to what their their program is about. Um, so I briefly say we've got uh, sort of Alex Turner from Washington um, University uh, over in Seattle. Lee Murray uh, and Vas Petrenko from University of Rochester. Um, but the Fetch4 project sort of spans, I think, all around the globe. Um, and we'll probably hear more about that um, in the introduction. So I think they're each going to give us kind of a, an overview of their individual work packages. Um, and then uh, if we wait till the sort of the end for questions, um, we'll go through those. Uh, but without any further ado, I'll pass over to Alex. Great, yeah, thanks for uh, having us give a presentation. We're also really excited to be part of the VESRA team. Um, so today we're gonna to talk about work on the FETCH project, which stands for Fate, Emissions, and Transport of Methane in Past and Modern Atmospheres. Um, myself, Lee Murray, and Vas Petrenko are the three overall PIs on the project. And broadly what sort of motivates this project is that methane is sort of both an important yet rather enigmatic molecule in the atmosphere. What I'm showing here on the top are the measurements of methane going back to the 1980s. And we see there was this sort of rise in the 80s, this sort of pause in the 2000s, and then continued rise uh, following that. So this stabilization is a rather fascinating sort of anomaly in this record. And the bottom part of this plot shows the time derivative of methane in the atmosphere, otherwise known as the methane growth rate. And so you can see during that stabilization, the growth rate goes to zero. Interestingly, we see an acceleration in the growth rate in 2020 and 2021. So it's the fastest rise we've ever seen in atmospheric methane. And there's other anomalies, like for example, in the 1990s, there was this slowdown of the growth rate where it sort of abruptly dropped from roughly 12 ppb per year to roughly two to three ppb per year. And broadly, these trends in atmospheric methane in the modern atmosphere really are not that well understood. And that motivates a lot of the work that uh, for this project here. So broadly, the atmospheric trends in methane are controlled by the balance between the sources and the sinks. On the source side, some of the biggest sources are things like fossil fuels, landfills, livestock, and biomass burning. Uh, but globally, the biggest source is actually the wetlands, um, which is a natural source, uh, comprising roughly 30% of the overall uh, methane budget. On the sink side, the sinks are a bit more straightforward, with most of the loss being via reaction with hydroxyl radical, otherwise known as OH, uh, which we sort of jokingly call the Pac-Man in the atmosphere, because it really sort of goes around abstracting hydrogens everywhere. Um, but sort of jokes aside about OH, it's actually notoriously difficult to measure. Uh, so direct measurements of really of OH are really insufficient for understanding methane trends. And it's a pretty sort of tricky molecule to understand. So broadly, these are some of the major factors that will influence methane in the atmosphere, uh, some of these sources and sinks. So returning to the sort of time series of methane, there's been a lot of speculation about what drove these variations in methane. And pretty much every major source and sink has been invoked to explain some of these trends we see. In the stabilization period, there's speculation about what the role of wetlands is, fossil sources, OH. In this acceleration, this interestingly coincides with the onset of COVID-19. So there's speculation about how COVID would affect uh, methane trends in the atmosphere. And then for this slowdown in the 1990s, it's often attributed to the collapse of the former Soviet Union. Um, but really, again, there's a lot of uncertainty in what's causing these variations in atmospheric methane. And if we step even further back in time, we can look over these glacial cycles and we see very large variations in methane over the glacial cycles. And many of these same questions also exist there. Uh, so there's uncertainty in the modern record and a lot of uncertainty in the paleomethane record as well. So generally some of the major uncertainties in the methane cycle are, for example, how have and how will wetland emissions change, which will depend on ecosystems, how has and how will the oxidative capacity of the atmosphere change, which depends on the chemical composition of the atmosphere, and how have and how will fossil methane sources change, which will depend on human activity. And so broadly, this begs the question of how we should move forward. And that's really where we think the FETCH project can help address some of this. Um, so the FETCH project stands for, again, Fate, Emissions, and Transport of Methane in Past and Modern Atmospheres. And some of the questions we're aiming to address uh, differ based on which time period we're focused on. So in the paleo record, we have these large changes over glacial cycles, which are commonly attributed to changes in emissions from wetlands. Uh, in the industrial transition period from 1850 to 1983, 
we have a large perturbation from human activity that really fundamentally altered the methane cycle. And in the modern record, we have the expansion of the global observation network, um, but we still have these sort of enigmatic trends that we observe in the modern. So in the paleo, things that we're looking at are, for example, what is the role of both sources and sinks in controlling the paleomethane cycle? In the industrial transition, we're interested in understanding what is the role of fossil methane sources and also OH in this pre-industrial to present day rise. And then in the modern, we're looking at again, for example, what are the causes of that slowdown, the stabilization, ren renewed growth and acceleration. So one of the things that really is the backbone of this project is some new ice topolog measurements that we're gonna be making to help constrain this methane cycle. Specifically, we're gonna be measuring radiocarbon of methane or 14 CH4 which in principle is an unambiguous indicator of fossil methane sources. So this is methane that's been, so for fossil methane sources that have been hidden from the atmosphere for thousands of years, all of this 14 CH4 will radioactively decay away. And those sources like fossil sources will be totally depleted in radiocarbon. However, using these ice topologs is complicated by the role of the nuclear industry. Um, but in principle, these should provide useful constraints on the fossil source. And Voss will talk more about this during his presentation. We'll also be making measurements of 14 CO or radiocarbon of carbon monoxide. And this radiocarbon of carbon monoxide is produced in the stratosphere, uh, high up in the atmosphere, and then it can be removed or oxidized by OH in the troposphere. And so the amount that you get at the surface would be inversely related to the amount of OH in the atmosphere. So really the amount measured at the surface indicates something about the OH burden or can tell us about OH. And then finally, we'll also be making uh, isotopolite measurements of the hydrogen isotope on methane. Um, and this is in part because uh, these source signatures of delta D of methane have less overlap than the carbon isotopes. And they also have a larger sink fractionation. So in general, what this means is they might be able to tell us something about wetlands and possibly OH. But really the other reason we're focusing on these particular isotopes of methane is because there's a, a lot less measurements than there are of delta 13C of methane. So we'll be providing new constraints on the methane cycle through that as well. So really this project, uh, the working group one, which is led by Voss Petrenko is focused on these measurements that will help constrain the methane cycle but to understand what these measurements mean about the atmosphere or tell us about the sources requires incorporating them into larger models. So Lee Murray is leading working group two, which is really focused on modeling uh, the atmosphere and simulating these isotopes. And then working group three is focused on machine learning or accelerating these models to be able to look at the longer time horizons uh, that we care about in this project. And we like to think that sort of the Fetch project falls right here in the middle, sort of bridging these three uh, working groups. So what I wanted to finish with are sort of the overarching goals of the FETCH project. And really, I'd say that the overarching goals are to make new isotopic measurements in Greenland ice cores and modern air samples, to develop satellite proxies of the tropospheric oxidative capacity, incorporate these isotop logs and satellite proxies into four different chemistry climate models, develop faster representations of chemistry climate models to interpret these measurements, and then finally, all of this will help us improve our understanding of the drivers of the methane cycle. And so we're gonna have three following presentations, one from Lee Murray, who's lead, sorry, from Voss Petrenko, who's leading working group one, which is focused on measurements. Uh, the second presentation will be from Lee Murray, who's gonna be talking about the chemistry climate modeling. And I'll give the final one on the machine learning work that we'll do following that. Um, so I'll turn it over to uh, Voss Petrenko now. Okay, um, can everyone see my slides okay? Yep, that's great, thank you. Great, let me just adjust things on my side a little bit. Go. Hi everyone, um, I'm Vas Petrenko. I'm at the University of Rochester, and as Alex said, I am the lead for working group one of Fetch4. Um, and working group one is focusing on obtaining new measurements. Um, I apologize in advance for any coughing fits that might happen during this presentation. I'm just getting over some sort of cold or flu. Um, 
So uh, there's a lot of uh, things, a lot of measurements that are part of working group one, since uh, I only have about 10 minutes for this brief presentation. Um, I'll just go over some of the key points of this. There we go. Okay, um, so objective one for working group one is to use 14 CO, so carbon 14 containing carbon monoxide in the modern atmosphere to improve understanding of spatial and temporal OH variability. <clears throat> so as Alex said, um, atmospheric OH uh, is the main atmospheric oxidant. Uh, it's the main sink of methane. Um, it's also the main sink of a range of other uh, reactive trace species in the atmosphere. So um, quite important for us to understand. Um, there is uh, quite a bit of disagreement between different models <clears throat> when trying to simulate OH, um, both in absolute abundance um, as well as in trends um, through time. Uh, so we need more observations to try and constrain this. Um, and uh, Working Group One um, has a lot of institutions and a lot of scientists involved. So as I go through the different components of Working Group One, I will just highlight <clears throat> the institutions um, and the folks who are working on this. So um, 14CO works uh, as a proxy for OH as follows. So production of carbon-14 in the atmosphere is by cosmic rays, uh, which interact with nitrogen-14 <clears throat> forming C14, which then is almost immediately oxidized to 14CO. Um, this 14CO is then in the production of uh, 14C in the atmosphere is strongest in the lower stratosphere, in the upper troposphere, um, and in the high to mid latitudes. Uh, this 14CO that is produced uh, is then oxidized by OH uh, to C14 of CO2. And because we know the production function quite well, um, and this is known from neutron monitors, it's the cosmic secondary um, uh, neutrons that interact with the nitrogen 14 to produce C14. Um, so we know the production function quite well, um, particularly over the last few decades when neutron monitors have been in place. Um, and then <laughs> knowing the production function um, and being able to characterize 14CO around the globe, um, we should be able to back out um, OH because OH really is the, um, the main sink for 14CO. So that's the idea behind the proxy. Um, once 14CO is oxidized, it's oxidized into uh, C14 of CO2, uh, which can then be ingested by the biosphere. And some carbon-14 <clears throat> in the form of CO can then be ultimately re-emitted, um, either through processes like biomass burning uh, or through atmospheric chemistry, oxidation of biologically uh, released uh, VOCs, as well as methane. Um, and this constitutes a secondary source, uh, which is less than 25% of total globally, uh, but does depend on um, <clears throat> latitude and season. So this is something that we take into account when interpreting the results. Um, so the plan for new 14CO measurements as part of this project um, is to measure at seven stations globally um, in years two and five of the project. So uh, this allows us to get uh, good global snapshots for every year that we do the measurements, um, <clears throat> looking at latitudinal variation and seasonal variation. Uh, we also have <clears throat> data from a prior year of measurements. So between the prior year of measurements um, and the years of the FEDGE4 project, we would also be able to look at uh, OH interannual variability as constrained by 14CO. Um, the second objective for working group one, um, as uh, Alex also mentioned, is using carbon-14 of methane in the modern atmosphere to improve the understanding of fossil methane emissions. Um, and this is, an, uh, again, uh, a number of different institutions and scientists uh, involved in this component of the project. Um, the image here is showing a natural gas processing facility, um, and the image is taken with an infrared camera showing a large leaking plume of methane. 
So why is C14 of methane useful for uh, constraining fossil emissions? Um, well, first, uh, to follow up a bit on the slide that um, I was explaining about the cycling of C14 of CO, um, with C14 of CO2, as it um, gets taken up by the biosphere, uh, C14 of methane uh, can get re-released from biological methane sources, uh, such as wetlands, um, wildfires, uh, ruminants. And um, in this case, the uh, carbon-14 activity of this methane will very closely follow the carbon-14 activity of atmospheric CO2. So if we know the C14 activity of atmospheric CO2, which we do, um, then we can predict what this uh, biological component of the C14 methane budget is. Um, but then, of course, there's also fossil methane in the atmosphere today. And uh, this methane is ancient. So the carbon has been isolated from the atmosphere for millions of years. Um, and the C14 radioactive half-life is only about 5,700 years. So there's no carbon-14 in fossil methane. So um, in principle, you could compare uh, the carbon-14 content of methane in the atmosphere with the carbon-14 content of CO2 in the atmosphere um, and use this very simple equation to calculate out the fossil fraction of the atmospheric methane budget. Uh, in practice, it's not so simple because of the nuclear power industry. Um, and the nuclear power industry emits um, quite a lot of C14 of methane directly. Um, this is a photo of the Jinnah nuclear power plant on the shore of Lake Ontario that's um, not far from Rochester. Um, <clears throat> uh, it's globally a very large source. So it's estimated that uh, roughly 40% of all C14 methane emissions are uh, from nuclear power plants, and it has a relatively large uncertainty. Um, however, even considering this, uh, C14 of methane still provides another useful constraint um, for the methane budget in combination with the other methane isotopes. Um, but another fact that really helps us in trying to um, use C14 of methane for understanding the fossil versus non-fossil contributions to the methane budget is the fact that the nuclear power is almost all in the Northern Hemisphere. So um, it's estimated that about 98% of all C14 methane emissions from nuclear energy are in the North. Um, and because of this, there should be a measurable interhemispheric C14 of methane gradient that is sensitive to the magnitude of the nuclear source would allow us to constrain the nuclear source and thereby <clears throat> would allow us to place better constraints on the fossil source as well. Um, so this uh, figure is from a preliminary implementation of C14 of methane in GeoSchem. Uh, the absolute values uh, on this map are unrealistic, but it supports the idea of this interhemispheric C14 methane gradient with values being higher in the north uh, and lower in the south. And uh, this is also something that we can detect from our recent fur and air measurements uh, from Greenland and Antarctica. Um, so the plan for um, atmospheric C14 of methane measurements um, is to set up at five stations. So these are five of the stations that we will also be using for 14 CO. And <clears throat> we would sample for one year um, in an averaging mode, uh, meaning we would collect samples over the course of a month. Um, uh, and uh, these samples would be very representative of the average C14 of methane over that month um, at a given station. Um, and this should allow us to uh, characterize the gradient within the Northern Hemisphere, um, as well as the interhemispheric gradient for C14 of methane. Okay, um, <clears throat> next part of uh, the working group one work has to do with uh, the changes in the atmospheric methane budget since the pre-industrial. Um, again, uh, quite a few different groups um, and scientists involved in this. Um, so since the pre-industrial, we have seen about 160% increase in atmospheric methane mixing ratios. Um, and this change is due to anthropogenic activity, but um, uh, there's uncertainty about how much of this is due to fossil fuels. Um, agriculture, uh, as well as changes in the OH sink. Uh, 
Um, <clears throat> and there's some significant current gaps uh, in existing records. So for example, we only have high resolution methane from the Southern hemisphere uh, for this time interval. Uh, we also only have very limited methane isotope data uh, from this time interval. So um, <clears throat> as part of the project, we're planning to obtain new fur and air samples and ice cores from Southeast Dome uh, in Greenland. Um, and uh, it's a site that has uh, relatively high elevation of about 3000 meters and uh, therefore it's relatively cold, which reduces summer melt events, uh, which is good for preservation of gases in ice cores. Uh, the site also has an extremely high accumulation rate by ice core site standards of about one meter of ice equivalent per year. Um, this means that there's relatively little diffusive smoothing of the atmospheric record in the fern, which allows for high temporal resolution, uh, which is good for what we're trying to do. Uh, and it also provides uh, a lot of shielding from cosmic rays, which is important for C14 of 14 co um, so what we're planning to do uh, with <clears throat> the Greenland work is uh, go to the site in 2026 um, and drill a, a first a three inch ice core uh, where fern air would be sampled uh, from the fern zone, uh, so down to about uh, 80 meters, and this will provide measurements of 14 CO, uh, methane isotopes, and a number of supporting trace gases. Um, and then an ice core would be collected from the surface down to about 300 meter depth. Um, and this will be used both to create an age scale for the ice core at the site, as well as to do very high resolution methane measurements um, and to provide this high resolution record um, through the industrial transition in the Northern hemisphere. Uh, we will also drill three ice cores of uh, four inch diameter um, and we will use <clears throat> very large volumes, so about um, 300 plus kilos um, uh, sample sizes to make measurements. Um, we will be extracting air on site um, from the ice and then bringing air back and analyzing it for uh, C14 of CO, C14 of methane, as well as um, other methane isotopes. Um, part four of the working group one work um, has to do with uh, improving the global coverage of measurements of delta D of methane. And um, <clears throat> so measurements of uh, methane stable isotopes, delta C13 and delta D have been ongoing for um, the past couple of decades, but um, delta D is um, much more difficult to measure. And because of this, the availability of delta D measurements um, has been much lower but it can be argued that it may actually be a more useful tracer for understanding the methane uh, budget than Delta C13, uh, because there is a larger range in um, source isotopic signatures, as Alex mentioned, um, and Delta D is also quite sensitive to fractionation <clears throat> of, uh, of methane isotopes during its removal by OH. So it can also uh, potentially tell us something about um, OH. So, um, and, and I forgot to mention once again, um, a number of different institutions um, involved, different groups that are um, either currently measuring uh, delta D of methane or are about to start measuring delta D of methane. Um, the goals um, for the delta D of methane uh, component is to continue existing measurements at uh, Utrecht University and uh, Tohoku University and restarting uh, measurements at INSTAR, uh, which is part of uh, University of Colorado at Boulder. Um, INSTAR is uh, tied into the NOAA uh, GML network and restarting the measurements at INSTAR would allow to um, really uh, broaden the Delta D uh, methane observational network quite a lot. Um, so this figure is showing <clears throat> compilation of most of um, the existing measurements uh, of methane concentration, as well as Delta C13, um, as well as uh, Delta D, um, sort of showing that again, um, there's much less available for Delta D um, and more work is needed in adding measurements as well as uh, intercomparing between the different labs. <clears throat> 
Um, and uh, briefly, the final component of working group one work is uh, improving estimates of the kinetic isotope effect, uh, abbreviated as KIE, or the reaction between methane and OH. Um, when we measure isotopes of methane in the atmosphere, and we then use those uh, to better understand the partitioning of sources um, and sinks in the methane budget, um, we have to account not just for uh, the different uh, delta C13 and delta D signatures of the sources, um, which do have overall different um, isotopic signatures, but also for <clears throat> the fractionation that happens in removal of methane from the atmosphere. And uh, that's represented here by this red um, double-sided arrow, um, and that's the KIE. And uh, the uncertainty in KIE is uh, quite large, um, and it has been identified as a critical limitation to using C13 and Delta D <clears throat> um, in understanding the source partitioning in the methane budget. So um, I will stop here and uh, pass it off to Lee working group two. Okay, thanks, Fas, and can everyone see my slides? Yep, that's looking good, thank you. Okay, great. Uh, so um, I am leading working group two, and I apologize because I have dual monitors, so I'm not looking directly at the camera. Uh, but uh, Working Group 2 is um, comprised of a uh, collaborative group of um, chemistry climate modelers uh, led by myself. Uh, and uh, we're also closely working with Alex Archibald and Paul Griffiths at the University of Cambridge. And uh, we will be leading a cohort of uh, hopefully four uh, postdoctoral researchers, three to be located at Rochester, one at Cambridge, each of whom will be working with uh, a different chemistry climate model uh, that we are collaborating closely with uh, the government scientists uh, who lead the uh, development of the reactive chemistry components of uh, these models uh, shown uh, below at the bottom of the slide. So we work with With the present day, uh, these models resolve not only the equations of motion uh, necessary for simulating uh, future and past climate scenarios, uh, but also uh, the comprehensive uh, tropospheric chemistry, which often requires uh, resolving uh, a thousand chemical reactions and transporting and tracking the uh, mass conservation of hundreds of chemical species. Uh, so these are uh, on the left, the left four columns, uh, the four uh, models that uh, we are working with in Fetch 4. Uh, they are four of the preeminent uh, chemistry climate models uh, in the world. Uh, and you can see that they all have uh, various uh, complex representations of uh, reactive tropospheric chemistry. Uh, and then in comparison on the right is a chemical transport model, which use prescribed meteorology and therefore is able to uh, put extra uh, computational um, resources into resolving um, chemistry uh, that uh, we'll also uh, be using uh, to help interpret the reactive uh, chemistry climate models. So, um, one reason that these models are so expensive is that within these reactions that we're looking at, uh, and we've already uh, in the overview and in Voss's talk seen how important hydroxyl radical is uh, for uh, for tropospheric chemistry, and particularly for methane. Uh, OH lasts on average less than a second in the atmosphere before it reacts uh, because it is so reactive. And uh, we saw that it is the dominant loss mechanism for methane, which on average lasts about a decade in the atmosphere uh, before it reacts. And therefore, uh, these chemistry cl climate models are numerically extraordinarily stiff. Uh, and that creates uh, a whole lot of challenges and why many uh, climate models uh, cannot afford to include this chemistry in their 
um, in their models and therefore often end up just prescribing methane as uh, which is necessary for the radiative transfer components of the model uh, just as a fixed abundance. Okay, so the three major objectives of working group two in the context of uh, the other uh, fetch for working groups is first uh, we're going to generate a bunch of um, training data that we're going to send to working group through the machine learning group that Alex will talk about in the next uh, slide uh, deck. Uh, but we're also going to take all of these new fantastic measurements uh, that Working Group 1 is going to be generating in order to help uh, interpret and uh, learn about the global methane cycle within our chemistry climate models. And then lastly, the key deliverable of the FET4 project is to take uh, the, um, the Working Group 3 products that Alex will be talking about uh, and then bring them back into the chemistry climate models, uh, and in particular, hopefully enable climate models that don't presently include methane chemistry to have a computationally uh, tractable uh, emulator uh, so that they can include uh, some of these very important feedbacks on the, uh, the climate system. So specifically, uh, first, we're going to implement these methane isotope logs within uh, four global models. Then we'll implement um, comprehensive tropospheric reactive halogen chemistry. Uh, I'll be going into more detail about each of these tasks in just a second. Uh, then we'll perform time slice experiments across uh, the paleo in the present day that will generate training data that we'll send to working group three. And then we'll also interpret science. And then lastly, as I mentioned, we will implement parameterizations that Working Group 3 is going to be developing back into our global models. Uh, so to go into more detail, first, we will implement online methane isotopologues within the four global models. This is something that I've already done for the NASA GIS chemistry climate model uh, from an earlier um, uh, NASA-funded project. Uh, so this is just showing for the four seasons as rows and for the three isotopologues as columns, uh, the, um, the spatial patterns of the methane isotopologues. Uh, and you can see uh, that there are useful spatial and seasonal variations in the methane isotopologues uh, that we can exploit in order to learn about the, uh, the global methane uh, budget uh, and go beyond ways that just simple box model analyses that have been traditionally used for interpreting the methane isotopolog measurements uh, by adding in that spatial and seasonal and temporal components that we can resolve in the global models, uh, we can hopefully learn um, quite a bit about um, uh, the, the factors driving the seasonal and temporal uh, changes that we see in the measurements. Uh, so our second task is to implement comprehensive tropospheric reactive halogen chemistry. Uh, so halogen species in the troposphere are uh, a relatively uh, new uh, topic, a uh, hot topic in tropospheric um, chemistry modeling. Uh, they um, have uh, in recent years uh, been realized to be uh, very important uh, and disruptive of uh, traditional uh, photochemistry that our models include. And in the context of the uh, methane isotopologues, they're very important uh, because even though OH is the dominant sink of methane, uh, the reaction of methane with chlorine has an extremely strong kinetic isotope effect uh, and uh, chlorine is very important uh, for setting the uh, the C13 uh, abundances in the atmosphere. So it's important that we include uh, chlorine reactive chemistry within our models if we want to get the uh, uh, get the isotopologues correct in the model. Third. Uh, we will perform time slice experiments for methane across the paleo and present day. Again, we'll be sending uh, this data to the machine learning team in order to, uh, uh, and uh, traditionally uh, model output in uh, simulations like these would be done only at monthly uh, 
resolution. And our goal will be to provide a much more spatially and temporally dense output for many more diagnostics than would be traditionally archived in a in a CMIP6 style model and a comparison project uh, that could then be used to train these, um, these emulators. But we'll also be using these simulations that we're doing uh, to perform uh, a lot of um, science while we wait for the machine learning test or machine learning team to perform their um, perform their tests uh, in order to go after some of the outstanding major issues in understanding the paleo and recent past changes in the methane budget. For example, uh, ever since the first ice cores were taken in the 1980s, we've never been able to close the methane budget uh, for the large plus or minus 50% changes in methane that we see. The wetland modelers say it has to be the OH changes. The OH modelers say it has to be the wetland changes. And we've never been able to uh, fully explain uh, what is driving uh, these changes. We'll also be looking at the fascinating changes in methane that occurred during uh, the Younger Dryas uh, abrupt climate event uh, about 12,000 uh, years ago, where um, following uh, warming coming out of the last ice age, suddenly uh, there was an abrupt cooling and a shift in uh, methane abundances that we see in both the North and the South Pole. And then lastly, we'll try to explore um, those enigmatic changes that Alex introduced in the overview for what caused the uh, stabilization, then the regrowth, and then the most recent um, record acceleration of the uh, the methane growth rate in the atmosphere. Uh, and then uh, we'll also try to explain why in these models uh, we have such uh, disparities in uh, global mean OH and its trends uh, over time, even when these models have been driven by identical anthropogenic emission inventories um, in the past. Uh, and then lastly, our primary um, Deliverable, as I mentioned, is to take the emulators that Working Group 3 will be uh, creating and put them uh, back online uh, within the CCMs, and then hopefully also within uh, just uh, general circulation models that do not include uh, reactive chemistry, so they can include uh, any important feedbacks on uh, the methane uh, lifetime within their simulations. And I will stop sharing and pass on to Alex for the Working Group 3 overview. Thanks. Uh, hide this real quick. So I'm Alex again. I'm uh, leading Working Group 3, which is uh, includes myself, uh, Greg Hakem here at University of Washington, uh, Julie Nicely at NASA Goddard and University of Maryland, and Kazu Miyazaki at NASA JPL and UCLA. So returning to these goals of uh, the Fetch 4 project, working group three is really uh, going to be contributing to these three bolted ones. Specifically, we're going to be developing satellite proxies of tropospheric oxidative capacity, developing faster representations of the chemistry climate models to interpret these measurements, and then finally trying to synthesize all this and improve our understanding of the drivers of the methane cycle. So there's five main thrusts of working group three. Uh, the first thrust is uh, developing these satellite OH proxies, which is led by Julie Nicely. Uh, the second thrust is box modeling work led by myself, uh, linear inverse modeling led by Greg Hakem and myself, uh, deep learning uh, led by myself and Greg Hakem, and then finally chemical data assimilation uh, by Kazu Miyazaki, uh, myself and Greg Hakem. And so uh, this first part, uh, the satellite OH proxy, uh, hits to this um, bolded goal of fetch. These middle three uh, are sort of accelerating the models and really uh, go towards this overarching goal of de developing faster representations of these chemistry climate models. And then finally, the chemical data assimilation is really trying to bring all this together and synthesize what we got from working group one, working group two, and really just uh, improve our understanding of the overall methane cycle. So I wanted to first start with uh, the first thrust, which is work led by Julie Nicely at uh, NASA Goddard and Univers University of Maryland. And the premise behind this actually goes back to some work um, from Lee Murray, among others, uh, who showed that um, global mean OH is really controlled by a handful of factors, including, for example, the ozone photolysis and specific humidity. And this is because 
the actual production of OH occurs when you photolyze ozone in the presence of water vapor, giving you two OHs. It's linearly related to the sources of NOx, which can help sort of recycle and give you back some more OH. And it's inversely related to the overall source, whoops, source of hydrocarbons and carbon monoxide. And that's because OH will oxidize those compounds. So broadly, there's a handful of factors that should generally control OH. And what's kind of exciting is that, that actually we have a lot of measurements in the atmosphere, both from satellite and surface, that are indicative of these processes that will reflect OH. So we can't directly measure OH that well. We can measure a number of other things that are strongly related to OH. And some of the work from Julie Nicely's group, uh, including this paper from Dan Anderson in ACP in 2013, uh, was actually developing machine learning models using satellite inputs to actually predict spatial patterns of OH at really an unprecedented, unprecedented scale. And so these were constrained using satellite or using airborne observations that were made in the Pacific uh, with vertical columns. And it really represents some of the best spatial patterns we have from observations of OH. And so one of the goals of the project will then be to use these new satellite proxies of OH within our chemical data simulation and continue to advance these to give um, essentially a near real time estimate of OH using satellite data that is recently become available and will uh, continue coming online. The second uh, main thrust of working group three is really sort of accelerating the models. Uh, and this is again, led by myself and Greg Hakem at University of Washington. And motivating some of this, I wanted to show some results from a uh, uh, work from uh, GFDL, some of our collaborators. So we previously used some simulations from the GFDL CM3 model in a paper back in 2018. And what's shown on the right are the deseasonalized OH variations from this model. Uh, this is a 6,000 year pre-industrial control simulation. And it took six actual years to run this simulation. So these simulations are prohibitively slow to look at uh, long time scales. And here we're only looking at 6,000 years, which is really not long enough if you want to consider, say, paleo records. Um, so it really just highlights how slow some of these simulations actually are, especially when you include things like chemistry. Um, so we have a couple of approaches to try and accelerate this. Uh, I would say that the first approach is really sort of the most simplistic, where you build up um, a fundamental representation of the system uh, and really simplify it down to just a couple little boxes. And you can use that to then identify what processes are most important in affecting your, say, methane isotopes. So my graduate student, Eric May, has been uh, developing uh, this box model. So it's a little four box model that simulates methane and its isotopes, including uh, 12 methane, 13 methane, uh, radiocarbon methane, methane with a deuterium, carbon monoxide, OH, and many of the major loss processes. And this model is now able to run pretty efficiently over the last million years. And so it really represents one of the first, uh, or one of the best representations of um, methane and its isotopes in a time resolved manner over those sort of paleo time scales. And so we'll then be using this uh, to sort of both inform what processes matter for the more complex modeling and doing some simple chemical data simulation with this model. At the same time, we've also been working on linear inverse models, which I would say are sort of an intermediate complexity emulator uh, with the most complex being deep learning, which I'll talk about in a second. So the linear inverse model essentially breaks the system into a stable or sort of a predictable set of dynamics and models the rest as white noise. And these are constructed through uh, sort of covariance statistics by looking at output from uh, other simulations. So we're actually starting this work using, again, that same GFTL CM3 simulation um, to build up a simple linear inverse model and see how that performs for the same system. Um, part of the motivation for this is the technique that's used quite a bit in atmospheric dynamics, but really hasn't been used at all in atmospheric chemistry. And the sort of intermediate complexity might allow us to look at things in a more detailed manner than the box modeling approach, but also be more interpretable than, say, deep learning. And the final approach is we're going to uh, develop deep learning models using output from working group two. And we'll have to use a different set of models for the different time periods of focus. So for the paleo, getting sufficient training data will be difficult. However, we know that these uh, simulations should satisfy some constraints. For example, the methane lifetime feedback should be well represented. And so we aim to bring in physically informed constraints and develop pins or physics informed neural nets for the paleo record.
For the modern period, we're aiming to do two things, both full replacement and partial replacement. And one thing that really separates the modern is that we're going to have dense observational data from both in situ and satellite measurements. And so we need to be able to resolve those spatial patterns. So our starting point for this work is really going to be a recurrent unit for the full replacement. And for the partial replacement, we'll aim to sort of uh, replace those chemical solvers and help speed up actual CCMs. And this will need large amounts of training data at very high time resolution. And then finally, all this will sort of come together in this sort of chemical data simulation piece uh, led by myself, Greg Hakem, and Kazu Miyazaki. And we're going to be doing some preliminary work uh, this spring using that box model uh, to constrain some aspects of the methane cycle. Um, but generally, uh, this chemical data simulation work will rely on results, both data and measurements, and model output from working group one and two. So this work will start more uh, later on in the project. And then one final point I wanted to mention, actually something we realized in the past uh, year or so, is there's actually some uh, novel histor some historical satellite data we can use in a novel way to actually study methane sources from fossil fuels. And we'll hopefully complement some of that radiocarbon measurements that uh, Vlas Petrenko mentioned in working group one. Uh, but specifically, there is a realization that these land surface imaging satellites, such as Landsat and Sentinel, can actually be used to study big methane point sources because they have really high spatial resolution. So there's been a flurry of work using say Landsat 9 and Sentinel-2 to do this in the modern and identify big methane leaks. But actually what uh, my group and my postdoc Tylon Key recognized is that actually Landsat 5 was the first satellite measuring at the appropriate wavelengths to make these measurements. And Landsat 5 launched back in the 1980s and Landsat 7 also covers uh, those same wavelengths. And so the combination of Landsat 5, Landsat 7, and Landsat 8 really give us a satellite observational record that is as long as our in situ record and goes all the way back to the 1980s. And what's shown here in the top right is an example of a methane plume we observed in Turkmenistan back in 1990. And really, you can see the actual spatial extent of the plume because these measurements are such high spatial resolution. And one kind of fascinating thing we found is that actually, in contrast to sort of prevailing narrative, we find an increase in methane emissions coming from the Soviet Union after the collapse, which is sort of counter to the prevailing narrative that there was a decline in methane emissions coming from that region. So I think these measurements in combination, say, with the radiocarbon measurements we're proposing to make uh, in Greenland, will really be informative on some of these methane trends. And so I realize we're getting uh, close to the top of the hour. So going back to the overarching goals of Fetch 4, um, Working Group 3 is really hoping, again, to contribute to these three bolded points, developing satellite proxies of the tropospheric oxidative capacity, develop faster representations of chemistry climate models to interpret these measurements, and more generally, just improve our understanding of the drivers of the methane cycle. Um, and so, yeah, I think that's all we have. So we're happy to take any questions or comments you guys might have. Thanks. Fantastic. Uh, thank you all three for that um, wonderful introduction to the Fetch project. And I guess we look forward to seeing how it pans out over the, over the coming years.